Good morning, RCC. We are happy that you guys are joining us today here in the sanctuary, in the overflows. And if you're joining us online, uh, we are, we're glad that you're with us. If this is your first time here at RCC, we'd ask that you fill out the blue card that is in the seat backs in front of you. And you can return that uh, or uh, turn it in in the lobby for a gift. And uh, we just want to know that you're here joining us today. And uh, uh, we thank you for being here. Also, those blue cards are for prayer requests. So if you have a prayer request, please put it in there. You can put it in the giving box in the back as well. And our prayer team will um, be diligently praying for you. So uh, we got a lot of things going on. Um, I'll highlight a few. Everything's in the bulletin. Um, but first, I'm going to highlight our knock and talk. So we have our grand opening coming up here soon. So we're excited about that at uh, the end of next month. And we're going to gather as a church on April 27th, and we're going to go tell our community about it. So we're going to have some invitations, and uh, we're going to go out. It's going to be really easy, low pressure, um, fun, knock on people's door, tell them, hey, we're from Restored Community Church. we got a new building uh, that's opening up, and we'd love for you to come if you're not attending a church already. So uh, please sign up for that online, and we need all of you guys, um, so we can be a nice, uh, quick, uh, and fun event. So uh, the more people, many hands, uh, will make it um, quicker and, and more fun. So um, we also need your shirt sizes. So we definitely need you to sign up. And then on the website, we'll, we'll have a, a place for you to put your shirt size because you'll be getting a RCC shirt that day as well. And um, we need to make sure that we have, we have the right sizes um, a few years ago, we ran out of the schmediums. So for you buff guys, um, you don't want to miss showing off your guns. So um, thank you, Chris. All right. So next we have our choir, um, and we've got um, sign-ups for that in the lobby. We want to uh, make our, our Celebrate America um, uh, serviced just packed with our, our choir. They're a big part of our, our Celebrate America um, uh, event that we do every year. So we are looking for more men and women, but especially the male voices. Okay, so, um, and if you can carry a tune, I see some people shaking their heads. No, <laughs> that's not the attitude that we want. We want up and down. If, if, if you can sing, we need you. We want you. It's going to be great. Um, so, um, uh, sign up online practices will start May 6th and that will be, um, from six to seven 30 and it'll be an, an every Monday thing. So, um, please sign up online or in the lobby. So last but not least, the women's annual retreat is coming up. So we are excited about that. Um, we have a lady, Cindy, uh, Walliver coming from Nashville, Tennessee, and she is a potter. She will have her pottery stuff up here, and she'll be um, making pottery um, while um, talking about this gospel, talking about, um, uh, you know, the, the, how an empty vessel can be um, made perfect with the, you know, the, the maker's hands. And so, um, I'm getting a little distracted because I'm thinking of the movie Ghost. Did you guys ever see that? Okay, so. Patrick Swayze behind Demi Moore. It will be nothing like that. It will be nothing like that. So, um, yeah, it, no, she, she's actually in, an incredible lady who has, uh, she's done, done these events all over the United States. And um, she, uh, she's been doing it since 1993. Um, she's, she's done it thousands of times, and it's going to be a really good treat for you guys. Um, she's also been um, overseas in Germany and also in Mexico, so um, you, you ladies are, are in for a treat. Sign up for that. The cost is $60, but if 
um, if, if that's going to prevent you from coming, talk to the women at the desk in the back, and there are scholarships available. We want to pack this out. We want ladies fellowshipping and hearing God's word and, and supporting um, Cindy as she travels here uh, with her husband from uh, Nashville, Tennessee. So uh, we also want to thank you for um, all that you do um, in your giving of your time, talent, and treasure here at RCC. Uh, we can't do all the things that we do um, here within our church, also um, in our community and, and across the world. We do so much through this little church in Eagle, Idaho. It's amazing, and it's because of your generous giving. So um, I just want to thank you for that. Um, if you're not partnering with us right now, um, we just ask that you'd pray and, and see what, what God has uh, for you when it comes to that. So... Uh, we have four ways of giving. We have the giving boxes in the back. We have our website. We have text to give, and then you can mail it in as well. Uh, let's, let's pray before we worship and hear God's word. Lord, we thank you so much. Uh, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the people here. We thank you for all the opportunities we have um, to uh, love one another, to spread the gospel, um, and to be a part of your church, Lord. We ask that you open our hearts and our minds to the word of God um, that Pastor Ben is going to bring today and that we would honor you in our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Will you guys stand as we worship the Lord together? Sing our God.
you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. All your ways are good. All your ways are good. All your ways are sure. I will trust in you alone. Higher than my sight. High above my life. I will trust in you alone. Yes, in you alone. Yeah. Where you go, I'll go.
together we sing praise to the Lord. Praise to the Good morning, friends. My heart is heavy this morning. Last night I was awoken several times to texts about one of our local police officers who, while we slept peacefully in our beds, made a stop on a criminal and, um, and he shot the officer uh, in the face. Um, he's on life support and family is making their way into town right now. Once a cop, always a cop, I guess. So let's lift up the family. God, we just want to stop right now and pause and pray for this family that's going through so much, uh, even as we speak. Lord, I pray that through this, even this tragedy, that you would work your work, that only you can work. Through the lives of uh, other believers around this situation, may you be glorified and may they be aware of your presence, even in this moment. Thank you, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. We begin chapter 4 of our study. And today's message I've titled The Bottom Line of Love. I want to reveal to you from our passage of Scripture three foundational principles about God. The eternal, unchangeable, holy God who created the universe and and everything in it, has made himself known 
to his creation. Everyone who would pause, and uh, Scripture tells us even the heavens declare his glory, but everyone who would open their minds and read the Bible, his written word may come to know him in a very intimate, personal way. God, the author of the greatest story ever told, chose to do something that no writer has done when he wrote himself into the story. The author, our hero, has put himself on the line in order that we, the supporting actors in this epic story, might come to know and experience him at the deepest core of our existence. But just who is God? And what is this epic story that I refer to in my opening statement? The Apostle John, guided by the Holy Spirit, is about to reveal to us some of the foundational principles of the very essence and core that is at the center of God's nature. John keeps peeling back this onion, so to speak, as he describes the the topic of love to us But now he gets to the nitty-gritty. That's Greek for bottom line. (laughs) He gets to the bottom line in his description of the word love. Now, he has talked about love before, but each time he talks about it, it's at a higher level. It's at a a more uh, intimate level every time he talks about it. We view love through the various lenses of God's nature, so in in order to understand it more, I want to show you in three foundational principles about God, right from our passage this morning, three foundational principles. If you'd like to take notes, flip your bulletin over, get in a writing utensil, and you can follow along with us. First, let's look at his essence. God is is love. That's very foundational, of course, to followers of Jesus. John continues chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Love is the third description of God's nature, which which John uses in this letter. He keeps repeating this cycle. He will talk about the spirit, the God is spirit. Then he talks about the God is light. We read about that last week. And then he talks about and refers to God being love. And then he goes back to spirit, light, love. Spirit, light, love. This is the third time he's made the complete cycle of those three. But every time he gives us a deeper understanding of those three things. And in here, in our passage this morning, he's going to reveal his depth of love. God is spirit. He does not possess a body like you and me, or, or even Jesus does now. Scripture describes him as being an overpowering fire which consumes flesh and blood. So we can't stand in our fleshly bodies in the very presence of God because 
his, his glory would consume us. Yeah, I think, harken back to uh, Moses who asked to just see God. And <laughs> I think God laughs and, and I think he, he goes, okay, I hear, I'll tell you what, here's what I'm going to do for you, Moses. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you in the cleft of the rock and I'm going to pass by just a little bit of my glory is going to pass by. And then when Moses returned to the people, remember what they said? Moses, your face is, what's going on? It's, it's a beacon of light. And he just experienced just a little tiny bit of God's glory. Oh, for the day when we get our new bodies, that we're going to be in the very presence of God in the throne room and behold him as he is. And it, well, it's, it's, it's unspeakable. We don't have words to describe how amazing that will be. Not only is he spirit, but he, John reveals that he is light. Not only in luminescence, we think of a light as the lights in the room here, but also in his holiness. Scripture describes holiness as light. And sin, of course, is darkness, as John has talked about. And God's nature is that of perfect holiness. We know that he is without sin. After you and I become his children, we take on this nature little by little of his righteousness and his holiness. At the moment of salvation, we're made completely holy. And then the Holy Spirit works within us. So we become increasingly more like him, increasingly more like who we are. God is love. Love is not God. Be careful how you phrase that. God is love. God sets the standard for love, and he is our plumb line by which all love is to be compared. God doesn't have love. He's not like love. God is love. He's the headwaters. All love begins with him. Everything God does, everything God is, is predicated from his nature of love. And we, his most beloved creation, are the targets of his love. A.W. Tozer put it this way. He said, the love of God is one of the great realities of the universe, a pillar upon which the hope of the world rests. But it is a personal, intimate thing, too. God does not love populations. He loves people. God loves not masses, but men. And I'm here to tell you today that God loves you. He created you. He thought there should be one of you in the world right now. God loves you. Someone might say, but, but what, what, what about how we read in the Bible when he gets angry uh, with something, or, or when he corrects and he rebukes his children. Well, everything good, everything that comes from God is good, and he's a good, good father. So like a good, good father, when he sees that we are in sin or that we're practicing lawlessness, a good father comes along and goes, hey, Ben, what are you doing? This isn't who I want you to be. I, I don't want you to be angry. I don't want you to be, you know, covetous. I, I don't want you to, to do all these things, you know, I mean, fill in the blanks. God says, look, I love you too much. This is going to wreck your life. So come over here. And sometimes he chastises us because he's a good, good father. How do we know that we are true believers? That's kind of the overarching theme of this entire book. So that you may know. John says this over and over. Uh, you've probably heard it. Um, several times now. I would guess that we've heard it five or six times, that, that you may know. Now, how do we know that we're true followers? How do we know that we have salvation? Well, God pours his love into us through his spirit, and then his spirit lives within us, and then he uh, causes us to be able to love one another in a, such a way that we could never do it on our own. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 5.5, 5, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into the hearts, by, into our hearts, by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. How can we know that we have salvation? Well, we know because we will witness God's love growing in our own lives and, and spilling out into the lives 
of others around us. This love is, is really part and parcel of God's Spirit indwelling in us and changing us more and more into his image. We become more and more like our Father. A child of God is, is born of God and therefore it must reveal the nature of God. The more we walk with God, the longer we walk with God, the more we'll start to act and think and speak and love like he loves. Verse 7, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. It's not enough that we know about God. The Greek word for know, gnosko, here is deep. It's a deep love and, and can be compared to the kind of love that we love perhaps a spouse with. Uh, the way you spend time together, you get to know them, their likes and their dislikes. You know their dreams and their desires for life. You can finish many of their sentences. And I try to do that on occasion, and, and sometimes Debbie wish I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. But this level of knowing someone only comes from spending time with them, significant time with them, listening to them, asking questions, and then remembering how they answered. The same is true here. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Not just about God, but begins to experience God because they've spent so much time with him. Three foundational principles about God. First, his essence, God is love. And then second, let's look at his nature. God offers restoration. God is the initiator of love. We know that. He loved us first. And we blew it. We sinned. And we separated ourselves from God. But because of his great love, he became our restorer. Verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested or um, revealed would be another word. In this, the love of God was revealed toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or um, the total payment for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. They'll know we are Christians by our love. God hasn't just loved us with words. That's good that that's where it started. But he also loved us in action. This action restored us to the Father. For God so loved the world that he mentioned his only begotten son to us. No, that's not how it goes, is it? No, for God so loved the world that he gave. First, he loved the world, that we're told, he, in this way. This is another way you could say it from the Greek. In this way, God loved us. He gave us his only begotten son. He didn't just say it. He did it. Singer, songwriter, Michael W. Smith wrote this song, and it popped into my head as I was writing these words on, on the computer last week. He said, love isn't love until you give it away. I love that song. It's a great reality. I can say I love you, but if you have a need that I can meet, and I don't meet that need and walk away and go, hey, hope, hope it works out for you. <laughs> yeah, good luck. <laughs> Christians should never say good luck. We have a God who directs the universe. Christians should say, I'm going to pray for you. In fact, I'm going to do it right now. I've tried to do that more and more in my life. Because I'll, say, I'll tell someone, I'll pray for you. And I think most of the time I remember, but there are times I don't. I forget the day gets busy and I just don't get around to it. So I try to stop right there and go, oh, I'm so, I'm so sorry. Or, hey, this is great. Let's... Can I pray for you right now? I've never had a believer tell me no. <laughs> no, you can't pray for me. They always say, yes, please. 
and then we pray together. I tried to take care of it right then. Colossians 3.17 tells us, and whatever you do in word or in deed, these are two different things, word and deed. One is, is the talk and one is the walk, the action. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The act of God sending his one and only begotten son into the world to lay down his life for us was, was not prompted by our love for him, but by his love for us. Romans 5, 8, and 9 tells us this, but God demonstrates, that's, that's, I like that word. Remember, let's go back to the Greek. God demonstrated, God demonstrates, and God will continuously demonstrate for all eternity his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. It's through Jesus Christ that we have peace with God. God didn't just say he loved us. He proved it by giving us his one and only son, the reparation that would cover our sin and justify us, saving us from the wrath of God. Listen, Jesus' death on the cross wasn't a disaster. It was a divine appointment. It came to no surprise. It was always, he was slain from the foundation of the world. Before you and I, before humankind was ever created, God knew what was going to take place. He knew that we would choose sin in the garden. He knew that. And he already had a plan to deal with that. And his plan was Jesus Christ. Listen, Jesus' death on the cross wasn't a disaster. It was a divine appointment. And when we come to understand the cost of our salvation, we must live out our lives in an appreciation to what God did for us. We must go beyond mere statements regarding the required death of Christ, having sentiments about it. We must go way beyond that. Someone has defined sentiment as feeling without responsibility. I can have a sentiment about you, well, I'm really bummed out that you're going through that crisis. But if I walk away, what good is it? We have to go well beyond sentiment here. Love goes well beyond sentiment. We must understand the price which was paid. Ponder the great love that purchased so great a sacrifice for us. And live our lives as a thank you note to God. May every day be a thank you note that you're writing to God for what he's done for you to bring you back to him. Three foundational principles about God. First, his essence, God is love. Second, his nature, God offers restoration. <laughs> thank God he does. And third, let's look at his work. God indwells or inhabits people. God indwells believers. Verse 12, John continues. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides or dwells. That word abide means to dwell, to live in us. And his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. In that sentence, you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God has totally loved you and me. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world who confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. So let's do a quick recap here. What have we looked at? Well, we've seen that God is love. We know that, we know that because of the scriptures tell us that, but we also see it demonstrated when he sent his son to, on, to die on the cross in our place. 
in order to redeem us so that we could come back into a relationship with him. And that's, if that's, and, and if that's where the story ended, that, that would be a really great story. But, but God didn't stop there. No, he has called you and I out of the bleachers of life to participate in this epic story of grace and mercy and, and salvation. We get to go and tell. We, we get to share the greatest news that the world will ever hear. That, that God loves them and that Jesus died for them and that the Holy Spirit wants to come and take up residence in your life so that you may know God in a very intimate and personal way. How did he do this? By, by, becoming, by coming to live within every believer's heart so that he could walk and that he could talk with us directly and pour out his love into our life so it would spill over from our life into those around us. I want you to think way back now into the book of Genesis where we learn how God accomplished this from the very beginning of the story, really. We learn that God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden in the cool of the day. How cool is that? Can you imagine that? I try to just, in my wildest imagination, be walking with my wife through this garden and God shows up. And says, hey guys, you seen any new animals today? <laughs> yeah, I saw this one down there. I'd never seen that, but what are you going to call him? Um, I don't know. Uh, how does platypus sound? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, to just be able to talk with God like that, it is, it's such an intimate, they had such a great relationship until sin severed the communication. You see, God can't be around sin. He, he can't. He's a holy and righteous. He can't look upon sin. So the relationship was severed in, in a horrible way. But his love for his creation was so great that he made a way to commune with them. We read in Genesis that he killed an animal, spilt its blood. It's the first time we ever read of a sacrifice. God sacrificed an animal and then clothed Adam and Eve with the skin of that animal. And now he could, they could commune with him again. But it didn't end there. While the Israelites traveled around the Judean desert for 40 years, God speaks to Moses in Exodus 25.8, and he says this to him. And let them, he's talking about the Israelites, that uh, we're following, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God wants to dwell among his creation. He wants to live with us. He wants us to know him. He wants us to, to literally get to know who he is, his nature, like every good father he wants to be with us. He wants to be with you. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God wanted to dwell with man. So in Exodus, we learn that he gave very specific instructions for the portable tabernacle, also known as the tent of meeting. There's a description of what it might have looked like that they lugged around the desert for 40 years. But um, the, the high priest was allowed to go into um, past the veil, half of that, about halfway through that. There's a very thick veil. And so the, uh, that's where God dwelt on that back half. Um, his presence would come down and he would speak um, with the high priest and they would offer sacrifices and Moses would talk to God there. And, and so this is he, how he dwelt among them. The tribes were, would be all around this tabernacle uh, so that they could literally see the presence of God coming down um, in a cloud, sometimes in a fire. It's just amazing. God wanted to be with his people even then. But wait, there's more. <laughs> God eventually allowed for his people to enter the promised land. And then what does he do? Well, David, um, you know, Joshua enters, and, and then you have this time that they're with God. They're still using the tabernacle. And eventually... God puts in the heart of David that he wants 
to have a, per, a more permanent home on top of Mount Moriah, the highest place in Israel. And so David gets all excited about this, and, and God says, but David, you can't do it. Uh, you're a man of war. You've shed blood with your hands, so I'm not going to let you build my temple. Uh, so David said, okay. And he, he says, Solomon, your son will build it. So what did David do? He didn't throw a sucker in the dirt. He, he went and he desi helped design the temple based on what God had told him. And he went, went around and, and he got all the funds that they would need to build this amazing building that was absolutely jaw-dropping. Are you getting this? God wants to dwell with his creation. And just when it seems like the story is at a crescendo, here he is. He's, he's literally inhabiting the praises of his people. He's living with his creation. Put on your seatbelt. It's going to get a lot better. The story is about to go viral. Because animal skins and tents and buildings could never adequately contain or, or deliver on the intimacy that God desired to walk and talk with his creation, God had another plan. He had a provision. See, all along, even here, uh, they had, were sacrificing animals. They were spilling the blood of animals to cover over their sin. And then God says, no, we're going to deal with this once and for all. God would come down from heaven to planet earth in a body. Jesus, born of the Holy Spirit and born of a woman, was fully God, so he could literally die for everyone. He would live perfect and righteously. He was born of a woman so that he could go to the cross and literally shed his blood in our place so that he could now dwell with us. Jesus came down from heaven, God, and dwelt among man, Scripture tells us. Isn't that amazing that God walked again with his creation? God would come down to heaven to, and, and from earth. It was always the plan. God once again walked and talked in the very presence of men and women, like when he walked in the garden. This was his son, Jesus Christ. He came on the greatest rescue mission that mankind will ever know. Jesus came down to earth, God in a body. He lived a perfect life so that he could be the perfect sacrifice for you and for me. He would restore us. And on the cross, he became the middleman. Picture this, one hand up to heaven, reaching for his father. He was fully God. And the other hand reaching down to us. And he connected us through his blood. He restored the relationship back to the father. You and I could never have apart from Jesus. There is no other way to the Father but through the Son, Jesus Christ. Yeah. You want to have a relationship with God? You go to the Son. He will connect you to the Father. Hebrews 1 tells us more. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, now this is the Old Testament, it's the Old Covenant, has in these last days spoken to us it's spoken to men by his son, by his son. This is Jesus Christ, the covenant of Christ, whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. You want to know who God is? You want to know what God is all about? Well, just do a study of the life of Christ in the Bible. If you know Jesus then you know God. Remember, Jesus said that to Philip. Well, Philip in his immaturity, and it's okay, I'd have probably been saying the same thing. Hey, Jesus, Jesus show us the Father, and we will believe. And Jesus goes, have I been with you this long? I, I, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You, you want to know what God is like? Study the life of Christ to get to know him at a deeper level level, who being the brightness of, of God's glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins on the cross, 
sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus right now is sitting at the right hand of the Father. And at this moment, he is making intercessory prayer for you and for me. Thank God for that. Aren't you glad that when you don't know how to pray, when I don't know how to pray, when something hits me and knocks me on my backside, and I just don't even know how this could be happening to me, that when I look up and I just don't have words, Jesus goes, I got this. I got you. Father, Ben needs this. Right now, you know what's going on. And this is what he's trying to convey. Thank God we have a, a person like that at the hand, right hand of the Father. But now, Jesus is in heaven. So how is God dwelling with his creation? That's a great question. And I have an answer for that. Thank you for asking that. That's brilliant. God left. As Jesus is getting ready to go back up to the Father... He's on the Mount of Olives. He's with his disciples. They had worshipped him. They had prayed. He had blessed each one of them. And now he's ready to go back to the Father. And he looks at them and says, I want you to go back into the city. I want you to delay. I want you to wait for the helper. I'm going to send you my helper. Don't leave before the helper comes. And then he will help you through your life. He will explain things to you. He will recall things that I said and that I preached that went right over your head. You'll now understand it because you have my spirit in you. It would come through the Holy Spirit who inhabits our hearts and souls. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy... Remember, we talked about the temple. God dwelling in among the people in his temple... Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? God is literally indwelling you and I, if you have indeed accepted the gift, if, if he is your father, if you've become a child of God, if you're a Christ follower, then your body is the temple of God, the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. And you were not your own, for you were bought at a price, the blood of Christ, Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God now owns you. <laughs> I'm so glad he does. I don't want to be a, you know, a, a cell phone or operator of, of Ben. I'll mess it all up. I was upside down trying to, to make it through the next minute. And then God came along. And then he called me, and I accepted his free gift of salvation. And now I'm his, and he is mine. Amen. For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. No one has seen, verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides or dwells in us, and his love has been perfected in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed that love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Now, God is invisible. In fact, Paul told Timothy this in verse, uh, uh, 1 Timothy 1.17. Paul writes these words, Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible. He's talking about his heavenly father. God is invisible and no man can stand in his presence as we've spoken about. Colossians 1.15 reveals that Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. Jesus showed us in the flesh and in his nature what God is like. We just need to draw closer to Jesus. And as we draw closer to him and come to know who he is, we will come closer to God and know who he is. If we love God, then we'll love people for which he died, people that he created and gave his life for, 
And if we genuinely love other people, we'll love God more and more with each passing day, not of our own power, but now we have the Holy Spirit. We have God in us, and he enables us to love one another in ways that we could never hope apart from him. And when we demonstrate God's love through acts of kindness and grace, people will see the love of God in our lives. Not just saying it, but doing it. Pastor Fred Craddock told the story of Oswald Golter. Golter was a missionary sent to preach the gospel to India near the end of World War II. After many months, the time came for a trip for him to go back home. His church wired him the money to book passage on a steamer. But when he got to the port city, he discovered a boatload of Jews had just landed. They had escaped from Germany, and they had been allowed to land temporarily in this country. They had been wandering and had no place to go, so they were all crammed into the attics of these businesses, this industrial complex that was down in the port. It happened to be Christmas that day, and on Christmas morning, this missionary went out to one of the attics where the Jews were staying. He walked in and he said, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Those of you that know the Jews would know that they, they would not reply with Merry Christmas. The people looked at him, the Jews looked at him and said, as if he was crazy, and responded, we're Jews. I know that, said the missionary. What would you like for Christmas? In utter amazement, the Jews responded, why? Uh, we would like pastries. They were starving. Good pastries, like the ones we used to have in Germany. So Oswald Golter went out and used the money for his ticket home to buy pastries for all the Jews he could find staying in the port. Of course, he then had to wire home asking for more money to book the passage back to the States. His superiors wired back asking what happened to the money that had already been sent. He wired that he had used it to buy Christmas pastries for some Jews. His superiors wired back, why did you do that? They don't even believe in Jesus. And Galter wired back, yes, but I do. That purchased him a way to share Christ with others. He didn't just say, I love you. He proved it. The title of our series is called That You May Know, a reference to John's overarching theme, that you may know that you have salvation, that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We've heard this now five or six times, this phrase. And my question to you this morning, do you know? Have you confessed Jesus Christ as your Savior? Are you depending upon him for your salvation? Just this last service afterwards, um, I was greeting people down here on the floor, and this precious couple came. And I noticed when they were two or three people back that they were, they were just crying. And so I kind of tried to hurry to get to them. And... They just said, we want to do what you said. We want to confess Jesus as the Lord. And I said, whoa, woo. There's no better, nothing better in ministry than that. Nothing better than that. Have you done that? You see, now they know where they're going. They know without a shadow of doubt that then when they leave this planet, if Jesus comes back to rapture his people home, they're part of the family of God. And they're going to be raptured. If they pass before that happens, they know that when they close their eyes on earth, they open them up to their Savior who purchased their free ticket to heaven. Amen. If you haven't made that decision this morning, I would ask you, why not? Don't put it off. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. None of us are guaranteed the next hour. If I didn't know Jesus and I knew that the offer that he had given, I would fall on my knees and cry out to him. Because the fear of God, the fear of eternity without him would be too great. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this morning for your son, the free gift that you've given us. It's not something we earned. We didn't love you first. You loved us. You gave your son, Jesus Christ, 
There's no greater love than that, than that a friend would lay down his life for another. We see that in Jesus, that he laid down his life so that we could live again. Thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you guys stand and worship the Lord with us? Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. Yes, I will follow you. Light into the world. Light into the world. Light into my life. I will live for you alone. You're the one I see, knowing I will find all I need in you alone, all in you alone, yeah. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. Yes, I will follow you. Do you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If I lose, oh, I will follow you, yeah, I will follow you, yeah, cause in you, in you, there's life everlasting, in you, there's freedom for my soul. Stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. Yes, I will follow you. You love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. This life I lose, I will follow you. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. disciples would tell Jesus a couple of times, Peter being, I think, the most famous one, Lord, I'll die for you, because that meant everything to them. The fact that you would die for Jesus seemed like this huge thing. But the question really isn't if you and I will die for him. A better, here's a better question. How will you live for him? We're all going to die if, if the Lord tarries. We're all going to experience death. But how will you live for him with the time that you and I have left on this planet? You, you and I each have a specific amount of, of time that he's given us. Yours is different from my time. How many, how, how many with the minutes you have left, how do you plan on serving God so that the first time that you meet Jesus face to face, you'll hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Welcome in. Come on into heaven. Enjoy everything that I've created for you. How will you do that? How are you doing that? It's a question I ask myself. How am I doing it? How am I loving others so that other people could look and say, eh, he's one of those Christians. They love everybody. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get that. How are you doing that? Go home and think about that. And if you haven't ever made a confession of faith, if you don't know for sure where you're going after this life, I want to help you make a decision that you'll know that you know where you're going after this life. I'll stand up here at the front. would be happy to share that with you. If you have prayer requests, we have deacons and deaconesses up here that can pray with you. God bless you. Have a great weekend. Take care.